Today I'm not rushed with a sermonic discourse because the clock is saying 331. <laughs> and so as I look at the clock, I realize there's no time and I can keep going as long as I want. But I thank God that you're here this morning and that we can continue uh, to look at this prayer of Jesus. The Lord's Prayer was very important to the early church. It was one of the documents of the early church that they see they took seriously. And I read about it and I read that there was a German pastor who when they were going through the crisis in Germany that he said everything can be found in the Lord's Prayer. And so that motivated me to look at it and so we come to the last petition, the fifth petition. Uh, shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, as we open your word, have mercy on this feeble lump of clay and use it this one more time for your glory. I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, I must say that Sister Fawn had sent me early when I started a version of the Lord's Prayer. I searched for it all week and I don't know why I didn't text you to say, can you find it again, please? <laughs> but I could not find it. I checked my emails, my messages, but it was a beautiful rendition, a beautiful rendition of the Lord's Prayer. And I think that it's something that we each should sit down at some time and just write it out in our own words, what it means to you at this point. But this last one, deliver us from the evil one. And I want to ask the question that if you were Satan, how would you attack the children of God. Another question is, how can our failures prepare us for greater things in the future? And I think that in scripture we see Noah, who got drunk, Abraham, lied about his wife. Moses murdered an Egyptian. And of course there's David who committed adultery and then had a man murdered to cover up his sin. Have you had any friends that when you hear of the bad news of your friend, that you say, there but for the grace of God go I. I have said that to myself so many times. And it's perfectly true that we can all take a lesson from the mistake of others and if we don't, we may find ourselves wishing we had. As John Newton put in his hymn, Amazing Grace, there are many dangers, toils, and snares on the road from earth to heaven. And it is only the grace of God that keeps any of us safe along the way. And that brings us to the second half of the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. That word deliver is very strong. A strong word. It means to rescue, to snatch. To deliver from what? either from evil or the evil one. 
The King James Version has evil. The NIV and most modern translations have the evil one. Which is correct? Are we to pray to be delivered from evil in general? Or are we to pray for a specific deliverance from Satan and from his power? In one sense, there's not much of a difference between the two. But there's something to be said using the phrase, the evil one. The commentaries, those who are much more smarter and advanced than I am, when they said that when this particular Greek verb is used with this particular preposition, it is almost always means to rescue from a specific person. Not from an abstract idea or thing like evil. And as we have already seen in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was personally tempted by the devil himself. In this context then, I think our Lord Jesus is warning his disciples not of evil in general, but of the arch enemy, the believer of Satan himself, of the devil and his power. And therefore we can understand this petition, lead us not into temptation, but snatch us. Save us from Satan and his evil schemes against us. And I believe that by this prayer we ought to put that text, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, where it says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so in the light of this petition, I would say that the prayer is, Oh God, don't let Satan loose on me. Oh God, rescue me from Satan and his marauding power and his destructive force in my life. It is a very personal prayer. Oh God, when Satan comes near me, protect me from his power. When you put the first half of the petition together with the second half, you get the answer to something like this. The petition is really a confession of our spiritual weakness. It is a prayer of those who feel their vulnerability and in the face of Satan, all is attacked. When we pray this prayer, we're saying, Oh, Heavenly Father, don't let me come to the place where I will succumb to temptation. Don't let me come to the place where I will be overwhelmed by Satan. But deliver me from Satan and his power in my life. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're expressing our own weaknesses in the face of trials and temptation and the difficulties of life. You're saying, Lord, by myself, I cannot make it. Amen. By myself, I can't do it. And when you pray, but deliver us from the evil one, you declare your confidence in God's mighty power. The first half is our weakness, but the second half is God's mighty power. Yes, the question is asked, is this prayer for cowards? Is this a prayer for people who are too frightened to do spiritual warfare? And I would answer that by saying, was Jesus a coward? Matthew 26 says, 
that in the garden of Gethsemane on the night before he was crucified, the Son of God knelt and begged God for the cup to pass away from him. The Bible says he prayed loud cries, tears to God to be delivered from that which was before him. He was the son of God, yet in the moment of his trial, he did not boast about his power. He didn't say, oh God, I'm ready to go. Oh God, I'm strong. I'll crawl up on that cross and die. But on the night before it happened, he cried out to God for help. What I'm trying to say here is that the victory of Calvary was won on Thursday night. The battle was won before Judas ever planted his betrayer's kiss on the cheek of Jesus. The battle was won before the spike was ever nailed in his hands. The battle was won when he prayed. He did not fail in his testing because he did not fail in his praying. And that thought deserves our careful concentration. Our Lord Jesus did not fail in his testing because he did not fail in his praying. The conclusion is obvious. If the Lord Jesus needed to pray this way, how much more do we? If he prayed, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more we need to pray about the things that are before us? And so Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 40 and following, it says in verse 39, Luke says, he went out and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he went off, prayed earnestly to God, and he came back and found them asleep. And verse 46 Jesus says, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And these verses explain chapter 6 here in Matthew and verse 13. In the moment of crisis, Jesus passed the test because he did not fail to pray. And Jesus' words to his disciples and his words are very simple. He says, before you face what the world has to offer and before you go to do battle with Satan, make sure you pray. Pray that you may not fall into temptation. In other words, one writer says, the battle is half won if you want to avoid temptation enough to beg God to help you. When you pray, you're admitting your weakness. When you don't pray, it's usually because you don't take temptation seriously. And this petition, which is on the surface very simple, is very profound. It's a prescription for the spiritual life. Do you pray this prayer? When you pray, say, lead me not into temptation, a confession of our weakness, but deliver me from the evil one, a confession of our profound confidence in God and God's power. When you pray this way, you will find no matter what happens to you, you will be delivered. Amen. You will not be defeated. You will not fail. God will take care of you in the midst of temptation. God will take you through it 
And no matter how difficult, God will bring you out of it. When all is said and done, this petition reminds us of how weak we are. Amen. Without the Lord's help, we are in big trouble every moment of every day. We're sitting ducks for the flaming darts of the devil. And unless the Lord help us, we will not only face temptation, we will succumb to it every single time. You heard that story. A little girl having a conversation with Jesus. And she heard that knocking on the door. That's the devil. She said, excuse me, Jesus. And she go open the door and the devil ran right over her. But the next time she hear that knocking, she said, Jesus, can you please get the door? And when Satan looked into the eyes of Jesus, he said, sorry, wrong number. The words of Jesus to Peter seem to go hand in hand with this petition. See, at the Last Supper, Jesus predicted that Peter would deny him. And he also predicted that Peter would not be utterly destroyed. He would be tempted. He would fall. And would eventually be restored. And so Luke tells us in Luke 22 verse 32. Simon. Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Amen. Not only that, I like the last part of the text. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Three times, Jesus called his name as if to assure him that even in the midst of the greatest humiliation of his life, the Lord would be with him every step of the way. The words of Jesus tie temptation together. Satan wants something from us in the moment of temptation, and God does at the same time. Satan the one would destroy us and God wants to deliver us. In this case, Satan's temporary victory in Peter's life leads to a much greater victory for God in the end. And so it is for us as well. Our defeats, bitter as they are, can lead on to a greater spiritual victory. Yes, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. The word translated has asked is a bit stronger than that in the Greek. It means something like a strong demand. Satan set his eyes on Peter and determined to bring him down by any means necessary. I find it comforting that Satan must ask God's permission before touching any of God's children. Sometimes Christians become frozen in fear because they have given Satan too much credit. Sometimes we talk as if Satan were a kind of junior God. Almost God, but not quite. As if he has 90% of God's power and 90% of God's wisdom and so on. But that is quite different from the biblical picture. The Bible says Satan is always revealed as a creature of great power, cunning, who is nevertheless first and always a created being. Satan is a created being. Yes. He has no power independent of God. He can only do what God permits him to do. 
As Martin Luther put it, the devil is God's devil. One Puritan writer called him God's lapdog. And surely, this is more biblical than viewing him as some evil force equal with God. If he is God's equal, he would not have to ask God's permission before attacking Peter. God is in control. Satan had to get God's permission to attack Job. And I should know that the you is plural in the verse. Satan wanted to destroy all of the apostles. But he specifically targeted Peter. Why? Remember I said, if I were, if you were the devil, where would you attack? You would attack the leader. And if the leader falls, the sheep scatter. And so Satan attacked Peter. If you go at the spiritual leader, Start at the top, because if you can knock off the leader, everybody else. And that's why Satan will attack pastors and elders and deacons and all the leaders in the church. That's where the scandal is today. Leadership. Because sisters and brothers, whether you believe it or not, everything rises and falls on leadership. Good leadership, prosper. Bad leadership, destruction. Same thing in the home. If parents are bad leaders, what happens? Good leaders, it's different. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And so Satan often attacks us. Remember this. We may think that Satan is going to attack us on our weak points. But I want to say today that I believe that Satan often attacks us at the point of our perceived strength. Not at the point of our weakness. After all, wasn't Peter the one who said, Lord, if everybody else abandon you, I will not. I'll stand by you. Now, if you ask Peter, six hours earlier, to name his strong points, no doubt Peter would say, I am bold and courageous. Sometimes I put my foot in my mouth, but at least I'm not afraid to speak up. And Jesus knows that I'll always be there when he needs me. But Satan, when Satan attacked, it came so suddenly, so swiftly, unexpectedly, that the bold apostle Peter turned to butter. By himself, Peter is helpless. In the moment of crisis, Peter failed at the very point where he pledged to be eternally faithful. Should this surprise us? Why should Satan attack only at the point of your self-perceived weakness? If you know you have a weakness, that's the very area you're going to guard. But if you know you have a problem with anger or with laziness or with lust or with gluttony, will you not be on guard lest you fall? But it's not so with our strengths. We tend to take those areas for granted. You say, that's not a problem for me. I have other problems, but that area is not a temptation at all. And friends, I'm saying watch out. Put up the red flag. The danger is ahead. When a person takes any area of life for granted, that's one area Satan is most likely to attack. Why? Because that's the one area where you aren't watching for his attack. When I was a boy growing up in church, 
I remember an elder stood in the pulpit and knocked his chest saying, there is no woman in this church that can call my name. And Pastor Luther, by the end of the month, somebody was pregnant. The pastor had to go baptize him in the river by night. It happened to Peter. It will happen to you. It will happen to me sooner or later. But I like what Jesus says. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. I think those words contain reservoirs of truth. They tell us that Jesus knew in advance everything that Peter was about to do. He knew his denials, the cursing, the repeated lies. Even more, Jesus knew that Peter would be a mighty preacher of the gospel. And so Jesus saw everything even before Peter knew anything about it. Also, look at Jesus' response to the fall is that to pray for him. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 7 and verse 25 that Jesus prays for us in heaven. And it is because of the prayers of Jesus that we are saved to the uttermost. In a deep sense, our salvation depends on the moment by moment prayers of Jesus. Our mediator in the sanctuary pleading his blood on our behalf. Yes, thank God that Jesus, our high priest, is in heaven and he can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He's been there. He knows it. None of us have ever sweat blood dealing with temptation. Jesus knows it. And Jesus prays. He says, Lord, there is Mike. I know he's struggling. Help him to stay strong. Jesus prays. Sharon needs your help, Father. Julio is, a, is in is about to fall into temptation. Don't let him be utterly destroyed. Malcolm wants to do the right. Help him. What an awesome God we serve that. The Son of God prays for us. And friends, without the prayers of Jesus, we would never make it. Thank God. But the truth is that Jesus does not pray for Peter to be removed from the temptation. Instead, he prays that in the midst of his shame, that he would not lose his faith altogether. Father, Satan wants to sift him, to destroy him altogether. Please don't let that happen. Jesus, pray for Peter. And finally, the Bible says, and when you have turned back, strengthen the brothers. The King James says, when you're converted. Was Peter a believer? Yes, he was. He had been a believer from the day he left all to follow Christ. But hear me, in some deep sense, Peter was never fully converted to God. When I said fully converted, fully surrendered, his soon-to-be shocking failure would be the means of God used to finish the conversion process in his life. What a word of grace that is. Jesus knew all about Peter's coming fall, but more than that, he saw that Peter would one day return to the Lord and be stronger than ever. 
And friends, I wish we would deal with each other as Jesus dealt with Peter. Notice, he never criticized him. And he never gave up on him. Jesus knew about Peter's denial long before it happened. He knew what Peter would do. And that's why Jesus says, when you have turned back, not if, but when. He knew that Peter's heart was good. He knew that after his terrible sin, he would return to the Lord. I think that's wonderful. Jesus has more faith in Peter than Peter has in Jesus. And he knew that Peter had important work to do. Strengthen your brothers. But it could not happen without the fall and his restoration to the Lord. It had to happen that way or else Peter would not be as fully effective in his mission for Jesus. And there's an important principle at work here. Those who study these things, I'm only listen, following them. They said, a bone that is broken often becomes stronger after it is healed. Something in the healing process actually makes the break point stronger than it was before. They said the same thing is true about a rope. When a rope breaks, the hands of the master splicer take the rope and repair it and it becomes stronger than it was before. The same thing is true about our failures. God can touch our broken places and make us stronger than we were before. Though we fall and fall and fall and though our faces are covered with muck and grime and bitter defeat, by God's grace we can rise from the field of defeat to march in new victory in Jesus. That's what happened to Peter. His guilt was turned into grace. His shame into sympathy. His failure into faithfulness. Why does God allow us to fail? And notice I said allows or permits. Never again would Peter brag on himself like he did that night. Never again would he presume to be better than his brothers. Never again would Peter be so arrogant and cocky and self-confident. All that was gone. Peter lost it. That's the price he paid for failure. It is a good thing that the Lord allows this to happen to us because by falling flat on our faces, we're forced to admit that without the Lord, we can do nothing but fail. And the quicker we learn that, the better off we will be. Amen. Failure never seems to be a good thing, but when it happens, if failure strips us of our cocky self-confidence, then failure is ultimately a gift from God. And that's what he did for Peter. Never again would Peter stand up and boast about his courage. And the Bible says, that Peter, when Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples and Peter. Because Jesus says, Peter, I have a big day coming. And you are my guest speaker. That's when Peter was at his lowest. Jesus encouraged him and said, a big day is coming. You are my guest speaker. I have not given up on you, sisters and brothers. I'm saying that the grace of God can transform the worst of sinner into a saint. 
That's the work of sanctification when we allow the Holy Spirit to do that work daily in us. It's a work of a lifetime. But we must trust God to do it. It's nothing that we can do of ourselves. It's God's work. And when we allow God to do his work, God will do God's work all by God's self. As long as we will not touch the glory. And so, if you doubt what I'm saying as I close, I'll say, here is the roll call of the broken saints. Think about it. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied about his wife. Jacob, that we studied in Sabbath school this morning, was a deceiver. Moses murdered an Egyptian. Rahab was a harlot. David was an adulterer. Paul persecuted the church. Peter denied Christ. Here is the amazing thought. Peter did much more for Jesus after his fall than he did before. Before his fall, he was loud and boisterous and unreliable. Afterward, he became a flaming preacher of the gospel. Before, he was a big talker. Afterward, he talked only what Jesus Christ could do for others. He was the same man, but he was different. He was still Peter through and through. But he had been sifted by Satan. And in the sifting, the chaff of his life had blown away. What Peter lost in his failure, he lost his vanity, pride, self-confidence, his unreliability. But in this, Peter gained humility, a new confidence in God, tested courage, a new determination to serve Jesus Christ. A willingness to use his experience to help others. And sisters and brothers, that's something that is sometimes lacking in our church. Because we pretend as if we have been perfect all of our lives. That we have never sinned. And the truth is sometimes when you see a young person going the wrong way, you just need to call them and say, listen to me. I have been there, done that, got a t-shirt and a hat. Been there. And I'm going to tell you my experience because I don't want you to go down that road. Save somebody. Use what has happened to you when God restore you. That's your ministry. The things he lost, he really didn't need. And the things he gained couldn't have come any other way. In the same way God redeems our mistakes by removing the things that brought us down and replacing them with the qualities we always wanted but couldn't seem to find, that's the encouragement of the story. And so friends, I tell you, the older I get is the more I try to understand the doctrine of grace. And this is the hardest of all the Christian doctrines to grasp. Grace. Because it goes against our deeply felt need to prove ourselves worthy. Grace says, you aren't worthy, but I love you anyway. That's hard to hear, hard to believe, and sometimes very hard to extend to other Christians. Meditate on grace. Think about grace. Rest in grace. Rejoice in grace. Talk about grace. Sheer grace. Sing about grace. Grace. 
not the girl next door. Grace, God's unmerited favor. Something that we don't deserve, but thank God, God gives it to us. And by grace, Mrs. White says that every child of God that entered through the pearly gates will be a conqueror. And the greatest conquest will be that of self. Only through the grace of God. Sometimes I say, God, save me from myself. I am my greatest enemy. Save me from myself. Friends, I want to tell you that until then, let's stand up and fight. Fight the good fight of faith because we know that God is on our side. And if God's power is on our side, Satan got to ask permission. Almighty God, forgive us for fighting our battles in the flesh. Forgive us for taking Satan so lightly as to think that we're an even match for him. Teach us to trust you completely. Believe that Jesus Christ has won the victory and to move from victory unto victory. Teach us to pray, lead us not into temptation that we might eventually be delivered from the evil one. Amen.